at the table, Laura Wexler, a professor of American studies at Yale University, who is also the director of the Photographic Memory Workshop. Billy Murray, one of the favorites here at Nerdland, and a former circuit court judge for the city of Baltimore, who works now as a criminal defense attorney. John Nichols, Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine, and author of the new book, Dollarocracy. And also, Michael Skolnick, another Nerdland favorite, who is editor-in-chief of GlobalGrind.com and political director to Russell Simmons. Thanks to all of you for being here. Professor Wexler, I want to start with you because your work is around the power of photographs and of images. And we in the Nerdland production staff have been seriously wrestling with this. Right. We've got two producers who were like, we got to see these photos. They could really change the whole Newtown conversation, the guns conversation. And, and, and on the one hand, I was like, yes, that's the Mamie Till Mobley. And on the other hand, ah, I understand not wanting to show the pictures yeah. of your slain kids. Yeah. Well, the two questions about a common interest in, in seeing them and an individual interest in privacy are already very complicated. But yeah. I think the question's made more complex by a kind of wish that the photographs themselves would serve as a magic bullet. Mm -hmm. If we could only see them, it would change the conversation yep. and perhaps be the finishing off of the stalling on gun control. And I know as a historian of photography that that actually is not so and it most likely won't happen. It's not true that a photograph by itself changes the politics. Mm -hmm. So we know this from many examples. You gave some, I would add in my own life, the My Lai massacre mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. girl being napalmed and Mamie Till's decision to show the open coffin of her son Emmett. But, you know, when Mamie Till showed that image, that image is, didn't travel around the world alone. There were a lot of people yeah. who were working on telling a particular story. Mm -hmm. What does that image actually mean? And that story had to be controlled. It's the story along with mm -hmm. the image. And just about coincident in time with that image were, was the fact that there were lynchings all over the country yep. and there were photographs made of them that were turned into postcards that were sent all over the country. Right. That didn't spread uh, civil rights and freedom. That spread terror and a sense of impunity. Right. So the images have yeah. to enter into a social movement that is precious. And it feels to me like part of what's happened in our in our guns conversation and 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 in, and in other aspects is that if the if the images just enter, they're just gruesome. Then they just become basically pornographic, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Rather than part of activating a movement. That's exactly right. And look, one thing to understand is this is a very different point in history mm -hmm. than the late 1950s, early 1960s. Yeah. We don't have three TV networks that come on at you know 6.30 or 5.30, yeah. depending on where you live. Uh, we don't have a, a handful of daily newspapers that really are definitional. Yeah. The truth of the civil rights movement is that when we started showing pictures, not just of you know Emmett Till, but of Bull Connor mm -hmm. shooting with those fire hoses, that did have an impact. Mm -hmm. But that was in a very different time. Today we are siloed. Today we have so many ways that we get information. I can tell you that if those pictures were released, and I'm not, I'm not yeah. a fan of limiting yeah. release of photos, right. but I'll tell you that if those pictures were released, you would have some sectors of our political discourse condemning the use of the mm -hmm. pictures for political purposes. You would end up with a debate about the pictures rather than about the issue. You know, it's interesting, as much as I am obviously a part of point of view news, yeah. right, that, that is really, I'm not a reporter, I'm not a journalist, I don't make any claims to be what we're doing here is always meant to be analytic and to have a clear point of view, but your point is an important one because it, the lack of that, of the one person who or one network that could sort of... Walter Cronkite. The Walter Cronkite yeah. who could put it out and then and you wouldn't feel as though it was being used in that way. It, it, is it about the siloing of of, uh, of our informational sources, or wonder, Michael, if, if it's also that we, we've gotten to a point where the images of violence are ordinary for us, right? We see them in popular culture so regularly. Well, let me tell you what was an unordinary about what happened in Newtown. I was just, my grandfather lives in Newtown, and I just took mm. my three-month-old son to see my grandfather for the first time mm. just last week, and I stopped by Sandy Hook. It's tr you can't go to the school, but you can go to the street just to sort of have my son and pay our respects to the families. Um, there's a young boy, Noah Posner, who's the youngest to die in Newtown. He was six years old, who was Jewish faith, and his mother Veronique um, wanted to give him a traditional Jewish uh, burial in his in his in his. Uh 
coffin and she went to put two stones, angel stones, in his hands. And she went to put one stone in his right hand and she closed the hand. And she went to put the other stone in his left hand and there was no hand there to put the stone in. So I think, you know, out of respect to these families, she made the governor of Connecticut, Governor Malloy, look at her son before she closed that casket. So she was courageous. Mm-hmm. She did do the Mamie Hill she moment did. with the governor. Yep. However, I think that for Americans, we have to see these images. This is not about politics. This is about lifting the consciousness of our nation. Mm-hmm. We have to know, yes, these were angels that went to heaven, mm-hmm. but this was a brutal, brutal attack on children whose hands were blown off, whose mm-hmm. faces were blown off, mm-hmm. whose torsos were blown off. This is not just about glamorizing yeah. or sensationalizing what happened in Newtown. This was horror. And, and of course, the reason that that kind of horror could happen to those bodies is because of the technology that was used to kill them. Sure. That's right. right. In, in, the, in the case of Emmett Till, it is... Um, I don't know any other word. It is the evil of the lynchers who who go so far as to do that to a teenage boy. In this case, it is certainly the evil of the shooter, but it is also the fact that he is working with a weapon mm-hmm. that that can can, yeah. that can, can, do, can this. do this kind of damage. Uh, before I answer, my mother's mad at you for calling me Murray. <laughs> now, now, Sorry. Here's the deal: we can't Sorry. predict how impactful these photographs will be in a political or non-political consequence. But legislation prohibiting them seeks to do just that. It says, in mm-hmm. all cases, mm-hmm. except the very exceptional ones, which God knows who will determine, mm-hmm. you can't release these photographs. That's why it's wrong. Yeah. The photographs are going to have to run their course, and we're going to have to see contextually how they play. All of us have had photographs impact us so dramatically that they've almost changed our politics and in some Mm -hmm, cases have changed our politics and photographs are a break on the evil of government they're a break on the evil of individuals Mm. and we can't give them up because a few people are justifiably upset Mm -hmm. in their personal lives about them this is a much larger issue yeah judge murphy which i'm gonna get that right now um (laughs) well we're gonna come right back on i was a man yeah we're gonna gonna come right back and talk more about this issue of photographs and the and the power they have and our our right to know as we come back The fight for gun control policy has come to a point where it seems like all of the things we think will sway the gun debate don't because the shootings and gun violence continue unabated. On Friday, yet another gunman went on a rampage terrorizing the city of Santa Monica, California. When he was done, he'd killed four people and injured five others before being shot to death by the police in a gun battle. According to police, he had 1,300 rounds of ammunition on him. When it comes to solving gun violence, there is no magic bullet that will serve, sorry, to bring the two sides together to come up with a solution. Instead of waiting on elected officials, the momentum for change has got to come from a cultural shift among the American people when we are finally no longer willing to accept rampant gun violence. You were, anybody who follows you on Twitter, Michael, knows that you were right on this Santa Monica story. You were, as you have been on all the gun violence stuff, you know, immediately saying, let's pay attention, let's focus on this. And yet it it had this sort of undercurrent in the news on that day. And even in the day since, it hasn't captured our attention. It's like we're we're just sort of inured to it. If we couldn't get a watered down background check bill passed after Newtown. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, Democrats and Republicans alike, yep. uh, we have a long fight ahead of us. And what happened on Friday in Santa Monica, you're absolutely right. People just didn't pay attention. And again, it was an AR-15. Yep. Right? It tore apart people. Yep. This isn't a weapon that you shoot deer with. This yep. is a weapon that you tear things apart with. So I think that um, we all have to do better. Yep. We all have to, you know, it, the, to, to the mothers and, and fathers in, in, in Newtown and Sandy Hook, um, we have to fight for them. For the mothers and fathers in Chicago who are losing their children on a daily basis, we had 24 shootings in 48 hours in New York City just last weekend, an yep. 11-year-old year old got shot in the neck and paralyzed. Yes. Young Tutu in, 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 in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And we have to stand up for young people like that and continue the fight. I'm not going to give up. Right. And, and people you can keep, follow me on Twitter, but I'm yeah. not going to give up. Well, I think people keep saying, right, that, I mean, we were looking at the, at the mass shooters weapons from 1982 mm-hmm. to 2012. Of those weapons, 143 weapons used in mass shootings, and 71 of them are, in fact, semi-automatic handguns, sure. right? So when, when people say, oh, these policies wouldn't make any difference, in fact, they would. When we look at how many of them were illegally obtained, this is uh, data from Mother Jones, 49 of them... Uh, 
uh, out of the 62 were, were illegally obtained. So it, in fact, would make a difference to have these kinds of policies. And yet, I wonder about this, this photos question. You guys got to talking a bit about the yeah. Osama bin Laden photos during the break. There was another instance where the public doesn't seem to have had a right to know. We didn't ever get to see those photos. And this is where the problem comes in. You know, and, and I really understand. I've got a nine-year-old daughter. Yep. So I really understand where folks are coming from in, sure. in Connecticut, and I respect that. But the fact is that when we start parceling out what you can see and what you can't see, uh, as has been suggested by wise folks on this panel, you end up assuming the impact will be this mm -hmm. or will be that. Mm -hmm. And we take the people out of the process. You know, we were talking in our break here about how members of Congress get to see certain photos, mm -hmm. get to see certain things. We make them a, a priestly class, a group of high priests. They are better than us. Okay. They can look at the photos, but we can't. But well, with all due respect, I can name you a number of members of Congress who I don't think will respond as maturely or as well as the average American. So why do we take the average American out of the process? That's my concern. Well, I mean, I, well, I think part of it... Because it makes it easier to get it done. Right. Uh, I if you hide stuff and then you stand behind, well, I told you, representatives, and 99% of the American public still don't know. You've mm -hmm. accomplished your political purpose of keeping it exactly. safe. Exactly. And those and representatives... this is the kind of censorship that we cannot yeah. abide. We well, cannot although, abide. Although, ordin I mean, I hear you on the, like, ordinary Americans, and yet, like, we had a Cheerios commercial with a beautiful little <laughs> interracial yes. baby and the white mom and the black know, daddy and the ordinary Americans lost their minds. So, so there's a part of me that like sometimes I'm like, yes, ordinary Americans should know. And sometimes I'm like, whoa, ordinary but Americans. Melissa Harris, <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Harris Turn off the Perry, you know a little more because of that incident. Oh, you sure. About, about the world. Yeah, and sure. So I gotcha. Can we, if we are to evolve as human beings, hmm. information? I think information is pretty useful. Well, in but, that you know, it's not actually just information. I believe we do need to see in order to know. I really think mm -hmm. we, can't, uh, we can't imagine what this hmm. is. We need to see it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that seeing is sufficient to hmm. knowing. Right. And so yeah. that's why I actually respect the bill that Governor Malloy put in place, even though I myself, as a historian of photography, want people to see. Mm -hmm. But I respect it because it has a sunset provision. It's saying that we have a moratorium for a year, mm -hmm. which is really asking us to have this discussion. All right, so bring, it yes. brings down the, yeah. the emotional piece. Yes, let well. us have the discussion. And we can't guarantee what the end of the discussion will be, but we can bring not the priestly class, but mm -hmm. the whole public into this discussion. But by the time we have this discussion... That's right. The emotion that's necessary and proper to move the ball forward hmm. is gone. Well, you know, we and thought after the killings that there, with that emotion, that was going to do it, right? Yeah, we but you thought, thought wrong. And, and it but takes that, another incident and another incident and another incident and more and more deaths. And so here is a clear case, I think, yeah. of where censorship is, is, is playing right into the hands of gun proponents playing right against the interests of the people who want these photographs sure. to yeah. be private. Can I tell you something yeah. else that plays into it? Just a quick one. It is the, and I know this is a tough one, because if I was one of these parents, I would, I would want to not have this discussion. But, but there's, there's an immediate rush in to say, let's not politicize this event. Let's let's have a decent period where we don't talk about it or we don't. Yeah, you but know, we want to. We right. want. We well, want the, but what I'm saying is, whether you want to or not, the bottom line is that that when we shut the dialogue down and when we slow the process down, that benefits the status quo. Mm -hmm. And and the fact of the matter is, a lot of a lot of people in Washington are like, well, why is the NS mm -hmm. uh, the NRA so silent? Mm -hmm. Why are they holding back? Well, I can tell you why. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. They were silent and they were holding back because they want to dial course, that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Down. Yeah, that's right. All right. right? So, so and, uh, and if you want change, you want to dial that conversation well, up. Speaking, speaking of dialing conversation up, especially on the issues of information and who has the right to know, we're going to turn the conversation just a bit in terms of talking about protecting privacy to the NSA conversation. Can we really protect and, and liberate information at the same time?
Okay, we're going to get to NSA in just one second. But but before we can get there, there's too much happening at this table that I need I need nerd <laughs> yeah. to be part of. So so there were there were a couple of, of really important things that showed up in the in the commercial that I, I just want to bring our viewers for. The first was this conversation about Rodney King yeah. and the Rodney King video and the idea that that Rodney King video was definitive. So I, so I want to ask you this, Judge, because. Obviously, the, the video was insufficient for conviction, right? You would think, right. I, I, I mean, so it was, it was sufficient for a kind of urban uprising, right? It made people feel like they knew what had happened. But, but the jury, in seeing it, doesn't make um, a conviction despite seeing this video. Talk to me then about why you still see the video as so critical to what happens in this Well, moment. the video is what got the federal government involved in the second prosecution. Mm-hmm. So remember how it went. First, the video. Second, tremendous outrage. Right. Third, cry for prosecution. Fourth, outrage about the acquittal in state court. Yep. Fifth, mm-hmm. cry for federal prosecution. Sixth, federal prosecution, conviction, end of story. Mm-hmm. So the video, without it, it would have just been another urban tale. Mm -hmm. It would have just been a story where the police are given the benefit of the doubt Mm -hmm. by white folks and indicted once again by black folks. The video brought the communities together. If I I can jump on top of that for a minute, I think that for most white people, we didn't think black folks got it this bad by the police. Mm -hmm. And once we saw that, for the past 25 years, now it's a conversation of police brutality, and we believe it. So Abner Louima, Amadou Diallo, we believe in police brutality. So that changed the whole consciousness. It's like the Bull Connor video. It's like the Bloody Sunday. Once you see those images, it makes it real. Remember the Another important aspect of this is that the photographs can actually also backfire so they yeah. can show that someone is a victim they can show the impunity of the of the violence and the perpetrators you have to control how the story around the photograph is used well i can yeah. get let me, there's a great example from another place of the killing of a number of Jesuit priests in El Salvador in yeah. 1989. And there were photos released, yeah. and it, it was horrific. Yeah. And uh, I was shocked at the time by the response. I remember it very well. Of a lot of people saying, well, boy, that's how it is in El Salvador. Yes. Mm. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't. That's right. The United States yeah. government has ties to people that yeah. are doing horrible things. It is horrible Don't things happen there. there. Yeah. And so, uh, again, it, you are so yeah. wise in your yeah. argument that we must yeah. put these in context. No, yeah. they have to come in context. Mm-hmm. And, again, if we circle ourselves around, yep. uh, I think that, that this gun debate is alive at this point. And so these questions, the context is there to some extent. It is. And but, that's yeah. but I think this point matters to, to me, I think, a lot. Because we see often gruesome images of, of happening to all kinds of bodies. But if we think those are the kinds of bodies yes. that deserve that's those sorts of... Or that that just happens. Or that that just happens, yeah. right? So yeah. you, you were talking about the just the up-close, beautiful, smiling image of Hydea Pendleton, oh, yeah. right? And, and the sense of, oh, yeah. this is the girl this shouldn't happen to. But for many folks, you know, the, the weeping black mother on an urban street right. corner, it's like, well, yeah, that's what black moms do. Their kids get killed and they cry on TV. And it becomes an ordinary part of our assumptions about what kinds of body. And it's part of where the Newtown power could come. But that's what yeah. the is it those changed, kids are, right? are not supposed well, to be the ones. That's right. And that's why yeah. Newtown changed the conversation because they were white. Right, the change of and they and they were and they were in and they were in school and they, and were, they were so young and, and they were so young. Right. Right. That's, That's right. really important because right. showing is always a matter of they, power. They who were, shows who is shown mm-hmm. and what is shown. That's not what was expected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where the power of these comes in. But Breaking we can't we can miss the basic point that we don't really have control in the first instance of how people are going to react to what they see. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the government wants censorship, and that's why we have to fight against it. Because in many, many cases, the people's reaction is correct. Mm -hmm. In many cases, their emotional reaction causes politics to change. Mm -hmm. And so we must not let these pictures be censored. So, so I, I love this one. We'll, we'll, we'll pause here and we'll come back on NSA because this question of how, how the people respond, the people definitely responded this week to the sense that, that maybe we're, uh, you know, we're living in a government where people are reading our emails when we, when we come back. All right. So while we're debating over whether the public should be allowed access to the horrific images from Newtown, there's a whole bunch of other information that's being accessed, of which we know very little about. According to the digital-based newsroom The Guardian, a court order shows that the National Security Agency, NSA, is collecting the phone records of millions of U.S. Verizon customers. On top of that, recently obtained top secret documents show both the NSA and FBI are data mining from nine of the leading U.S. Internet companies. That data that they are mining 
according to the Washington Post, includes audio, video, chats, photographs, emails, documents, and connection logs. Here's what National Intelligence Director James Clapper had to say to NBC's Andrea Mitchell yesterday in an exclusive interview. So the notion that we're trolling through everyone's emails and voyeuristically reading them or listening to everyone's phone calls is on its face absurd. We couldn't do it even if we wanted to. And I assure you, we don't want to. So, John, James was like, I want... We don't want to read your email. Keep your email. You people are trying are to boring. buy terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> you people like, are Please tweet yeah. less. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, boy, the second he used the word voyeuristically looking, mm-hmm. I thought to myself, gosh, I, it's, it opened up this whole new notion that a, you know, a bored NSA person at, at 2 a.m. might, in fact, be voyeuristically looking <laughs> through emails. I hadn't thought of it that way. Right. Look, here's the bottom line on this issue, and this is a huge issue. Um, but it's a huge issue being addressed at this point completely out of context. Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is, in 2006, 2007, Russ Feingold, the chair of the Constitution Subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said they're taking our emails, they're they're data mining this stuff, they're listening in. I mean, he was talking about all of this. If you go back and look at the articles from 2006, I wrote them, Mm -hmm. and they're talking about the same thing. So what we've got now is confirmation. I think it upsets some people that Barack Obama is doing some of the same things George Bush did, and we thought that he would be very, very different. Um, but Who thought that? Who thought that presidents would be different no, than presidents? I, I mean, yeah. I got to say, like, if you thought that, you're bad. Presidents well, are I'm Democrat, you. Republican, black, white, Chicago, Midwest, South. The presidents really like control I over. I wrote that at the time. Yeah. And I and but here's here's one thing that is really vital to put this in context. Yeah. And uh, we spent in this new book, we've got we've spent a lot of time looking at the digitalization of politics. Mm-hmm. And one thing people should be very, very conscious of is if they think the NSA is trolling through their data, you should look at what political candidates and political parties are doing, and you should look at what corporations are doing. And, and, you know, actually, it's the corporations that actually make me most... I guess part of what I find interesting about the outrage is... um, Sure, I I understand the outrage around the NSA. Mm -hmm. I also recognize them as part of a democratically elected government, which at least in theory is is responsive. Google and um, Facebook and Twitter and all of these to whom I just simply give away my information are corporations that aren't... There's no even imagination that they would be responsive. And we tend to give this information away to them. Well, I'm suing Google and Facebook right now. Yep, I know this. (laughs) Because they have tracked... Uh, their users, mm-hmm. and in some cases, their non-signed uh, up users, mm-hmm. internet mm-hmm. Uh, surfing habits. They can tell what articles you've read, mm-hmm. they can tell yep. what your politics are, they can yep. tell what you buy. Yep. And the danger of that is obvious. Nobody should know that much about you. Mm-hmm. And there ought to be transparent privacy policies that let people opt out of these services rather than you having to go through one page after another and read fine print and whatnot and then ultimately be confused about what the privacy yeah. policy is, which right. is today's state of mm-hmm. play. And so we're suing them because we believe they violated the Wiretap Act. Mm-hmm. Now, let's take it a step further. We always believed that one of the reasons we ought to stop this corporate data mining is because the government was going to get it. Mm -hmm. And the government can get it very easily on top of the table, and now we find that they're getting it under the table. And this is a vast data mining uh, project unlike anything in the history of the world. There is nobody that knows more about us as individuals today than ever before. That includes Soviet Russia. That includes uh, China. That includes all of the nations of the world. So this is big time stuff. This isn't stuff to sneeze at. And Big Brother has arrived. And you know how he arrived? with the best of intentions. We were always sure. afraid he would. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would always uh, wonder whether or not Americans are going to say security trumps everything, yep. and that's how dictators get started. Right. I mean, I'm obsessed with adolescent dystopic novels. I read them as my sort of airplane mm-hmm. reading, and they, it's always about these authoritarian societies that begin with the best of intentions that's for correct. the purpose of making people safe and happy and secure. And in both the kind of Newtown photos case and in this case, it's in part a question about individual liberties. And how much we're willing to take even the negative aspects that come with individual liberties because we see liberty itself as such a value. But it's a bigger question. It's a bigger question because this is changing our politics and our lives. The fact of the matter is when, and and I know we're talking about the corporate, being very concerned about the corporations. Understand this. When political parties and candidates rely on data mining 
to determine how they communicate mm. and who they reach out to. They begin the game of piecing together a narrow coalition mm -hmm. instead of those visionary statements that, that might build a governing coalition that could actually do something. We are narrowing mm. our discourse. So they, start, they sell us a government instead of, exactly. instead of trying and, to create a That's not my healthy. Only, my only concern yeah. with, with that argument is that, yes, political campaigns and, yes, corporations are a problem. They might lead to a mailer. They might lead to a, a, a phone call. But NSA leads to an arrest. NSA leads to a lifetime oh, it's, in detention. So it's the, power, it's the power of the state and this the idea that the state has. not diminish yeah. that mm -hmm. at all. But it is to say that we need to understand that, you know, I mean, we, we, we actually still think the, of the word propaganda as an unsettling thing, so, yeah, right? Yeah, so there's yeah, another professor. problem about it as well, which is that it, there's a predictive quality to it. So mm -hmm. all of the big data and all of the data mining and the pattern of our lives that they can put together from that can be used to predict, for instance, that you are profiled as the kind of person that is likely to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the, you can be detained and then in prevent. Well, Tom Cruise did a movie about that. Aha, uh -huh, that's yeah. right. And this is now landed for real. Yeah. Well, and, and in fact, actually, I'll, I'll make a claim that, that we already do that, and we just yeah. do it on, on less predictive data <laughs> like skin color. Oh, yeah. When we, yeah. so I, I just want to say thank yes. you so much, yeah. Professor Wexler, for joining us. Um, the rest of the panel is staying around for more. Up next, Downward Dog and the Devil. Wow, seriously. Remember stories like this from the late 1980s? In New York, Tracy Watson, who is six months pregnant, smokes crack cocaine, usually 20 vials, $100 worth a day. She knows the risks to her baby. Chances that the baby could come out premature, deform, really is the health way. It can come out addicted, too. That was the grim future predicted for the so-called crack babies born to drug-addicted mothers, infants thought to be doomed for life with developmental and physical disabilities, destined to drop out of school or commit crimes. But that turned out not to be quite true. According to Maureen Black, a professor of pediatrics and epidemiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, the crack baby scare was overstated and not substantiated. She is the lead author of a new review of 27 studies covering 5,000 children. The research found only subtle differences in the behavior of kids exposed to cocaine in the womb and those who weren't. In fact, some studies say the cultural assumptions about the crack babies may do more harm than the drug itself. For a closer look at the real impact of drugs on our society, I'm joined by Carl Hart, Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology at Columbia University and the author of High Price, A Neuroscientist's Journey of Self-Discovery That Challenges Everything You Know About Drugs in Society. Back with me are also former judge and criminal defense attorney William Murphy, Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine John Nichols, and editor-in-chief of GlobalGrind.com Michael Skolnick. So um, I want to start with you, Carl, because this um, book was really Really, in fact, quite intense um, to read, in part because of moments like challenging our fundamental assumptions, like the crack baby narrative, about what drugs do and don't do to us. What are the big myths that we have about drugs? There are, there are multiple myths. I guess one of the biggest myths is that the majority of people who use drugs like crack, heroin, methamphetamine are addicted, mm -hmm. when in fact they are not. The vast majority of people who use drugs, for example, 85% or so, do so without a problem. But yet, most of our attention is focused on this small pathological uh, numbers of users. And when you say addiction, the way you define it in the text, you say an addiction is not just about regular use, right? That's just a pattern of behavior. Addiction is when it creates problems in your family life, in your work life, in your sense of self. And so you're saying that for 85% of drug users, that is not the circumstance. That's right. If One of the things that people will help people think about this more reasonably is just think about alcohol. We know people who use alcohol on a daily basis, a glass of wine here and there. Yeah, I live in New Orleans every uh, exactly. Exactly. Basis, right? <laughs> exactly. That's so, not even an indictment. Yeah, no, no at all. <laughs> Problem if you don't. Uh, <laughs> That's right. So when we think about when we think about how we use alcohol in this society, mm -hmm. there are people who use cocaine in that way. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I, I want to be clear. No one is suggesting it's a good idea to do cocaine or smoke crack while you're pregnant, right? That's any, any more than we would suggest it's a great idea to, to smoke or to drink while pregnant, right? But it is... A, or, the, not, or not to eat well, not to exercise, all of those things. Right? That's right. And, and yet there is a way in which the social norms, the stereotypes that, were, that, that came as part of this kind of moral panic around it created real policy interventions. In fact, in some cities, the desire and the ability and the laws to lock up women who were found with traces of, of cocaine in their system, that they could be incarcerated if they were pregnant. Yeah, uh, you, are, you are a historian where you're a political scientist, but you know history. Yep. So if we go back at uh, the turn of the uh, 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 20th century, early 1900s, these sorts of things were done with powder cocaine mm -hmm. in terms of black people. There was a 1914 article in the New York Times called The Negro Cocaine Fiend is a New Southern Menace, in which it was described that black people on cocaine uh, are more, mur more murderous, they are unaffected by bullets, they rape white women, a wide range of things. So drugs have always been used as an excellent scapegoat mm -hmm. to go after of those groups in which we don't like in this society. Now, one of the things I love most about the book is, is the way in which you talked about what happens to rats, right? right. So a lot of what we know about, about how brains um, respond to drugs has to do with what we know from animal studies. The idea that rats, when kept in lonely cages, solitary, without social supports, without other things to do, without sex, do a lot of drugs all the way to the point of death. But if they have, you know, a girl rat in there with them and they've got some friends and family and something to run around on, they do less drugs. Yeah, it's just like us. Uh, if we have some alternatives, some things that compete with drugs, somebody you like, uh, some other activity, uh, the likelihood of you using drugs, certainly to a pathological point, is decreased. And we know this, and we have known this. But the problem is, is that that hasn't been emphasized, in part because drugs are great scapegoats. Mm -hmm. They increase the budgets of not only law enforcement, but also researchers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. I also, I actually, I, I love your research where, where you actually are giving, so I, I want to ask one last question, then we'll start to pull other folks in here because we're going to keep going on this. But this was, um, there were, I had a couple amen moments reading the book. We'll talk about some of it as we go forward. But one of it was just this, that, that data show that teens who are either not caught or are given non-custodial sentences for their crimes related to drugs do better in terms of employment, education, and reduced recidivism than those who are incarcerated or otherwise removed. What that suggests to me, right, what those data suggest to me is that the problem isn't the drug use. The problem is being, like, so if you use drugs but you're never caught, i.e. if you are from a privileged community. In other words, if you're white. Right, right. White, white and privileged, right? You have to also be, so if you're a college okay. student who's doing the drugs between classes, that the real problem, the, 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 the loss of employment, the loss of educational opportunities, the loss of social standing, comes from the incarceration, mm -hmm. from the arrest, mm -hmm. not from the drugs. Well, one of the things I tried to do in my book, In High Price, was to show, use myself as an example. Yep. Um, so if you look at me, I certainly did drugs as a youth. I certainly engaged in petty crime. And there were friends of mine who did the same thing, but they got caught. They got mm -hmm. caught up. Mm -hmm. They are currently, their lives are currently destroyed. I'm a professor, a tenured professor at Columbia. Yep. So, I mean, that's the sort of anecdote that supports the empirical information. Yeah, I mean, our, our last three presidents, uh, uh, I mean, yes. um, President Obama has admitted to, to having some recreational drug use, President Clinton to some recreational drug being aware aroundness. <laughs> touching and, it. Right, <laughs> <Not> touching <laughs> it, but not inhaling. <laughs> and, and of course, a, a president who had an alcohol problem in the in And the also, 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 and also marijuana. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. absolutely. All right, I'm bringing everybody else way, in too. as right. soon as we get back from the commercial because we are just getting started. <laughs> there, th this, uh, this book is setting the table for us, but we are talking about the drug war in black and white when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. This is a new report. It's a big one. It was released just this week from the American Civil Liberties Union, and it unequivocally lays bare the truth about our national drug policy. And the truth of that policy is this it's biased. It's broken, and it is costing us billions. The ACLU's analysis took an in-depth look at the enforcement of marijuana possession laws, and here's what they found. When it comes to marijuana, use rates among black and white Americans are nearly equal. In fact, in every year from 2001 to 2010, more white folks than black folks between the ages of 18 and 25 reported using marijuana in the previous year. 
But when the ACLU looked at who our justice system condemns to criminality because of that use, the analysis found a vast inequality. Black people are nearly four times more likely to be arrested than white people who light up at the same rates. And between 2001 and 2010, most of these arrests, 88 percent of them, were for simple possession. Not people like the suburban mom charged with running this three million dollar pot operation. No, the vast majority of people whose lives become ensnared in the criminal justice system after a marijuana arrest were found with just enough for personal use. Those cases where someone was busted for simple possession account for nearly half of all drug arrests. The ACLU calculated one marijuana arrest every 37 seconds in 2010. That's every 37 seconds that you should imagine money flying out of your pocket because the price tag for enforcing the marijuana possession laws that enable those arrests is $3.6 billion of your taxpayer dollars. In exchange for your money, here's what you get from drug policy. A complete failure to decrease the availability or use of marijuana. And hundreds of thousands of people, disproportionately African American, whose lives are often irrevocably changed by entering the criminal justice system. Here with me now is Carl Hart, Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology at Columbia University. He's also served on the National Advisory Council on Drug Abuse and is the author of High Price. Judge Billy Murphy, a criminal defense attorney and former circuit court judge for the city of Baltimore. John Nichols, Washington correspondent for The Nation and author of Dollarocracy, and Michael Skolnick, editor in chief of GlobalGrind.com and political director for Russell Simmons. All right. Yeah. Is there anything in this that isn't just that we didn't already know? No, there's nothing Thank in you. it. There's nothing in it that we didn't know uh, if we were paying attention. Yep. But it is still very, very important. In a way, it's like the NSA stuff we were talking about mm -hmm. before. Uh, we know a lot of stuff, but to have it confirmed, to have the data, to have, yep. have it come out, and to force this conversation that we're having right here, it comes in context because there's something I happen to think of as very, very positive going on in this country. Across this country, people are voting to strike down these laws yep. against marijuana. Uh, we have you know, statewide referendums across this country, local moves to decriminalize, even to legalize. And that is, that's so vital because the fact of the matter is, everything this study shows us, tells us that the only way that we're going to begin mm -hmm. to address this is with removing those laws. Yeah, you this, cannot change right, right. What this report ultimately comes down to is saying, look, you just simply have to legalize marijuana for 21 and above. You have to create certain kinds of rules around it, right, the same way that we have around alcohol. But you can't, you just can't expect an enforcement that isn't biased as long as it's illegal. Melissa, I, I don't know if we need to legalize hmm. marijuana. Okay. I mean, in my, as, as I uh, delineated hmm. in my book, I think the first thing we need to do is decriminalize it. And that's So okay. decriminalization yeah. means that uh, it, it's no longer it's still illegal, mm -hmm. but people can't get a criminal record for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the first step. And then the second step we need... Help, help people who are listening to understand the difference. Give me something in this world that is illegal, but not criminalized. Okay, let's think about driving. Mm -hmm. When you have a driving infraction, instead of sending you to jail, you pay a civil fine. Yep. That's decriminalization. Yep. Okay. Uh, and, and that's what we're. That's what I argue for in mm -hmm. terms of marijuana yeah. and all drugs, in mm -hmm. fact. But in terms of the legalization, one of the things that concerns me is that that the country is like adolescents. They're infants when it comes to drug education. There are so many myths and misunderstandings that people will get in trouble if you mm -hmm. do have a widespread or wide availability. Mm -hmm. So criminals, criminalization for me is an intermediary step mm -hmm. in where we can have a corresponding amount of education that goes along. Oh. And then if we want to reevaluate and think mm -hmm. about legalization, that's fine. Then that's possible. Now, yeah. what, why, why do you say uh, uh, all drugs should be decriminalized? Thank it's you. a very important. No, one. that's a great point. Uh, I say that all drugs should be decriminalized because drugs are just like automobiles. In the fa in, in the, this simple fact, just like automobiles, they are potentially dangerous. But we know how to minimize the harms associated with automobiles. We can mm -hmm. do the same thing with drugs. But you, the American public, has been misled to believe that drugs are so dangerous that they cause these extreme brain changes. Simply not true. Not supported by the weight of the evidence. Is, is, it, is it not true that, that drugs... Um, uh, 
is it are you are you making the claim that illicit or illegal drugs are simply not that different than those things that we get via prescription or over the counter or are you saying that drugs really don't have that much of an impact on our brain chemistry because i'm just thinking you know people who are going through everything from cancer treatment to infertility treatment recognize that when you put a substance in your body it can make enormous physiological no, 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 difference you, you make an excellent point yeah. uh, when we think about a drug like methamphetamine mm-hmm. for example and do you know adderall yeah. adderall mm-hmm. is the attention mm-hmm. deficit disorder mm-hmm. d- drug which we hand out to kids that's right and yeah. they they are the same drug i mean my research shows this other people's mm-hmm. research shows this. I, I talk about it in the book they're the same drug mm-hmm. when we think of drugs like morphine which we use for mm-hmm. pain exact same drug as heroin mm-hmm. uh so or oxycontin yeah or oxycontin the rest of these things now that's not to say that people can't get in trouble with these sure. drugs. It's just simply to say that we know how to decrease harm and we know how to mm. use these things. But Carl, doesn't that also take us to the issue of self-medication? Okay. We have a lot of people who, who um, in, a, in a broken healthcare system, are looking for something to ease a pain. Uh, and we have a lot of our drug problems in this country are legal drugs. Right. But, but if, if I could just back to the ACLU report for a moment, right, if yeah, I could, yeah. the, the challenge is the ramifications of the racial bias of our yeah. drug policy. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Stop and frisk here in New York. Right. We have more marijuana arrests under stop and frisk than gun arrests. Right. It turns right? out it's really it sucks for guns. Not so bad Not for so marijuana. marijuana. And so here's what happens. Right. A 13, 14 year old kid gets picked up for possession. Yep. He goes to jail for a night. Just one night. Mm-hmm. He goes to jail and says, I, judge, I could do this. Right. But I could do a night. And then the next weekend, he gets picked up. He gets the weekend because the judge is not in on Friday. He got to wait till Monday. He does the weekend. I could do a weekend. And this, I could do six months. I can do 18 months. I could do 36. I could do six years. I could do 55 years. I'm 65 years old and dying in jail. So it's conditioning young black and brown yep. young people right, of a life in prison. Well, let so me tell you how bad it is. Let me tell you how bad it is. On the streets, there is a saying, you're not a man unless you've done some time. Now, mm-hmm. you can't get any worse than that. Mm-hmm. My God, this is black men uh, 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 persuading other black men that a rite of passage is going to jail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Give me a break. Well, but but that said, we've had we've had um, kids at, at the table here. We try to often bring in young people who have said to us that it is it's less that sort of pressure from other young African Americans and more not just the well I can do that, but the dehumanizing experience of walking down the street and finding yourself suddenly pushed against the wall, mm-hmm. yeah. having your mm-hmm. pockets turned out right, and that sense that. If you are a citizen of a country, if you are, if your mom is a taxpayer, if she's a school teacher and you're walking down the street, but your body becomes always assumed to be criminalized, the impact that that has, but not just, just not just sort of like emotionally, if, if you get these arrests, sometimes it means no more student loans. That's right. Sure. No more living in public housing, That's right? right? No more um, uh, opportunity for certain kinds, for many, in many places in the country, no more ability to vote, right? So we actually shrink our electorate. Can we, uh, let's let's talk about some of the assumptions related to Mm -hmm. the way we uh, legislate these drugs. One of the major assumptions is that drugs are so dangerous. Marijuana is so dangerous, so we have to go after it with all of this force. Because it's a gateway. It's a gateway, it's dangerous. Now, one of the things that I've learned in all of my years of research is that drug effects are predictable. Increase the dose, you can get some toxic effects. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've learned from my research and also from living is that black men and black boys' interactions with the police are not predictable. Mm -hmm. That's why you got Ramarley Graham up in the Bronx, the kid who was killed because they thought he had marijuana. That's why you had Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. George Zimmerman thought that he was under some influence of some drugs. That sort of belief, those assumptions are even more harmful when those kind of things happen. It, it, was, it was useful as, as, as I was reading the text that part of what's going on here is you say that, um, that when we talk about drug use, it's not just an individual physiological experience, it's a collective experience. And you say one of the big myths of drugs is the idea that crack destroyed black communities, that crack is the thing that came in and destroyed urban communities. And I'm just thinking, Michael, you and I are around the same age, maybe you're a, a tad younger, but I, I mean, all of those films, right, sort of from that moment that said from New Jack City to Boys. I mean, it was all these Jungle films that fever, say you know, the whole deal, the right? That, that crack we was killing that. our communities. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it was just a you know a, a bombardment of media yeah. that you know black people and black people are bad and bad and bad and bad. And then we bought it. We yeah. bought it. Yeah. Right? We bought it hook line and yeah. we, we bought it. And not only that, we said in hip hop. Even today, there are people yeah. who are still saying how awful crack cocaine is. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, and then on the other hand, they're lamenting the laws that punishes crack cocaine. Mm-hmm. They don't need. Well, and it's also such a convenient it is such a convenient uh 
target, such a convenient thing to talk about. Because what do we have in that parallel of that period? We have the deindustrialization of our urban areas. Mm -hmm. yes. If you want to look at the Lock history down, of yes. the last 25 years, really, yeah. this period, you're going to see factory after factory after factory That's right. closing. That's right. And one of the fundamental realities is that you've taken areas where often people were invited to come from the south to the more enlightened north, come and live in these neighborhoods, and then you have ripped the economic core out of them, yeah. right? And, you've le and, and, and you say, well, it must be the drugs that are the problem. You know, as, soon, yeah. as soon as we come back, I want to talk about alternatives uh, to this. And, and because I, I just want to be really clear, parents, we are not encouraging you and your children to all like smoke crack together. That's not what's going on here. But we do want to bring down, tamp down the anxiety so that we can have a serious look at what actually needs to be done. What are the real problems when we come back? New York's stop and frisk policy is an epic fail when it comes to its goal of recovering illegal guns. But it's been much more successful at something else, the city's very own version of marijuana drug policy. According to the New York ACLU, of the more than 500,000 stops conducted last year, nine of every ten of them resulted in no arrests and no summons. But stop and frisk resulted in more than 5,000 arrests for marijuana possession. In fact, it was the cause of more stop and frisk arrests than any other offense. And of course, the primary targets of those arrests were the 87 percent of black and Latino New Yorkers who were stopped and frisked in 2012. Confronted with the rigged rules of this biased system, Nerdland friend and host of This Week in Blackness, Elon James White, got together with a few other familiar Nerdland faces and came up with a new, with a few stop and frisk rules of his own. Then, inspired by the notorious B.I.G.'s Ten Crack Commandments, he put those rules together in a hot hip hop track called The Ten Frisk Commandments. And the innocent still get stopped and frisked all the time. I'm American, I put the cane with some sort of rights that was undeniable. Whether my skin was dark or light, so much fright. Abuse of authoritative might, such, such a sight. sight to see young folks scared to even fight for their rights. Right. Guess what? We need more voices who are white. Let's, Let's unite night. to put this shit to bed and say goodnight. <laughs> Joining our conversation from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I know we've never had an intro like that before, is the city's police chief, Christopher Burbank, a national expert on reducing racial bias in policing, immigration policy, and using social science to ensure police equity. It's so nice to have you, chief. Thank you for having me. Um, so talk to me just on a very basic level. How do you train a police force to police without profiling? Well, a difficult challenge because we all come with inherent biases, things that we've learned through out our growing up years but the focus always needs to be on behavior never on what a person looks like but what is their behavior what can we articulate and that's the rule when you look at reasonable suspicion and probable cause standards of law that's what they're based on how does a person look is not an indicator of criminal activity, but their behavior absolutely is. Well, now, let me ask you a question, because we were talking just a few moments ago about uh, decriminalizing marijuana and other illicit drugs. What would happen to your police force, to, your, to, the, to the way that you use resources, if you were not having to make arrests for drugs? Would it, would it shrink your resources because you get resources from the federal government, or would, you, would it grow your resources, freeing you up to do other kinds of criminal investigations? investigations. Uh, again, as I've listened to the debate that uh, has gone on before, the idea, the notion that we no longer jail or imprison people for use or possession right, frees up resources, no question about it. But we always have to look. When you look at behavior, if there's criminal behavior going on and the underlying or root cause of that may be some sort of addiction or problem with either drugs or alcohol, well, we need to treat that. And we've shown time and time again in this country that simply putting people in jail does not solve this problem. In fact, we are better when we have alternatives to incarceration. We utilize those programs. Recidivism drops off. And then we avoid some of the negative impact that comes. As an administrator, if you send people out and say, enforce certain rules and regulations and we're going to hit these hard and have a zero tolerance policy, you absolutely impact people of color negatively. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about this notion of alternatives to incarceration, because I saw you make sort yeah. of a face about it. I know that yeah. it's one of the standard things that we talk about is alternatives to incarceration, but I saw you going, eh, I'm not one sure. Of, one of the things I want to make absolutely clear mm -hmm. yep. is that there has been a misguided focus on either 
jails or treatment. Mm -hmm. You have such small numbers of people who are actually addicted. Mm -hmm. What about the vast majority of those people who are not addicted? That's where the focus should be. Clearly, if people are addicted, we want to help them. And oftentimes, their addiction has a lot more to do with other things than the pharmacology of drugs. But we have focused on drugs as if that's the real problem, and that's a mistake. Right, so living in, well, living in isolated circumstances. Living, living in, in isolated poverty. circumstances, unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, not knowing uh, about responsibilities, mm -hmm. not having any skills, a wide range of things that we know mm -hmm. uh, uh, how to deal with. And I love what the chief is trying to do, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to be a dismal failure for a couple of reasons. Number one, where you police is something that is decided on a level higher than his pay grade. That's true everywhere. And decisions have been made all over the country that you don't police in the white community for drugs. You don't do it. And so the overwhelming number of arrests for drugs are because the police emphasis is almost strictly in the black community. So, so Chief, what, Chief, what do you say? That? That's, that's what we call the old drunkard search, right? Where does the drunk look for his, um, his keys? He looks under the street light. Why? Because that's where the light is, right? Not because that's actually where he's most likely to have dropped them. And so similarly, if police are only policing in communities where they expect to find drugs, for example, black and brown inner city and poor communities, does it simply just create a circumstance where you don't even bother to look in the other places. Well, absolutely, that is a valid concern. But the thing that I take exception to is the fact that a police chief, right, that I have no authority, it is contingent upon me, right, as an administrator to do what's right, to say, no, I'm not going to do this. Right? No matter what the pressure comes from, and absolutely, if we start looking at arrest rates and we're simply rewarded for the number of people that we arrest and put into jail, for no matter what the uh, circumstances are, but especially for drug arrests, well, then we're not doing the right thing. And so, as a police administrator, I need to stand up and say, this is how we're going to police Salt Lake City. And I'm not doing my job in order to keep my job tomorrow, but I'm actually telling the mayor, those people, the city council, that this is a better way to do business. In fact, this but, is going but, to have more but, impact. But, but, if, you are not, if you chief. are not coming up with proportionate numbers of arrests for whites as you are for every other ethnic group, your policy has failed. Because we know whites use the same number of illegal drugs as blacks do. Mm -hmm. And so are you telling me that in Salt Lake City, 90% of your drug arrests are white? I doubt it. And so oh, there yeah. is a racialism implicit in your policy that until you treat everybody the same under the law, you're not going to get rid of it. Are you telling me that the number of open investigations for drug dealing networks are nine times as high in the white community because you got nine times the illegal drug use and distribution in that white community? I doubt it. And so no, what are we really talking about here? I think it's a great band-aid. Let me, let me, I think it's a great band-aid. Before we jump in here, I, and, and I respect what the judge is saying, but I, I want to also say something. I cover a lot of communities across this country, and, and one of the things that strikes me is that there is a genuine, I don't want to say revolt, there is a genuine uprising among enlightened police chiefs and among enlightened sheriffs more and more of them stepping up and saying we have to do this thing differently yep. now the judge's insight becomes useful because it is a pressure to keep yep. going that way but i really think that that it is a very vital thing to recognize that it is police chiefs and sheriffs who are often now in the lead yeah, of questioning. Yeah, and, and, right, and let me, yeah, let me but just I don't say, want anybody just, patting let me, themselves. Right, right, sure. But, 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 let, me, but let, me just, let me just say this, particularly to you, Chief Burbank, in, in Salt Lake City. I, I mean, I, I, the dance that I would do to hear my police chief <laughs> in New Orleans say anything like the sentences that you have said, to even acknowledge the ways in which um, the, uh, the, the policing is, in fact, occurring uh, 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 in a racially biased way. So, I, so actually, Judge Murphy, I I really appreciate this. I also appreciate, uh, uh, Chief Burbank, that, that you have an acknowledgement of what's happening here. And it's clear to me that this is, this is not an easily solved issue um, and that we will need uh, police chiefs like you as part of this process. But also, we are always going to need the moral conscience of people like Judge Murphy, the research of people like Carl Hart, and of course, the writing of people like John Nichols. Thank you all for being here. Michael is going to stay with me. Because we're going to lighten up a little bit. It's Sunday morning. No, you we are like Michael. I, I know we like Michael. <laughs> we're going, but we are going to the movies next. It is summertime. It's movie time, and I'm going to ask the question: Is this the breakout year for black filmmakers? Actor and director Tim Reed joins a stellar panel here in Nerdland next.